a foot between you and the microphone. Does that go, Mr. Hammond? Remember, if you're a little short, I have a chair here for you to kneel on. You can gently kneel, not stand. I'm going to bring it up here, if you would like. If you do not need it, you can put it right back in the cubby here. Gary, it's your question. to people at home. My name is Miss Sydney Wallingford. We are the sixth grade advanced writing projects class here at Garrison Middle School. We are here to present our feature articles that the uh, kids have chosen to write about a community member of their choice. We hope you enjoy our first annual event here at Garrison Middle School. Alrighty, without further ado, our first amazing contestant, Miss Vivian. Come on up. My name is, oh. <laughs> okay. Hello, my name is Vivian Staples, and I'm writing a feature article about my uncle, Chad Staples. Chad Staples' riv riveting life story. When you think of a veteran, what image comes to mind? A tough-as-nails man who doesn't take no as an answer? What about a person with a head full of stories about the military? You probably didn't think about a devoted father, uncle, and brother, a man who has a serious and fun side, a man who would protect his family no matter what. You might be thinking, who is this man? This man is Chad Staples. He has gone through hardships and overcome them. He knows what death is and how you should live your life to the fullest. He is as tough as nails and has many stories to tell. This is his story. Chad Staples' childhood was spent in a little house in a small town called Riverton in Utah. He grew up with six siblings, and he was the oldest. He shared a room with his younger brothers. On the weekends, he would go running in the mountains with his dad, brothers, sisters, and uncles. A smile slipped through his features as the memories of his childhood appeared. All the times I spent with my dad, brothers, and uncles. We all loved them, horses. When he wasn't riding horses, he would go hunting for rabbits, deer, and coyotes. He would also attend school. His brother, Trent, recalled a favorite childhood memory shared with Chad and Garrett. It was the first time their father, Steve Staples, let them, go, let them go hunting on their own. Chad was 16, Trent was 11, and Garrett was 7. They went to a place called the Coops, and right at dusk, a buck emerged. After bickering a little bit, Chad finally lined up the rifle and whammo. The buck dropped dead. Trent and Run on the way back to Katosh to tell their father. They were visiting their grandmother. Once they made it back, they gutted the deer. While they were gutting the deer, Garrett exclaimed, I'm too young to see this. He would also spend time with his sister, Dree. She recalled one of her favorite childhood, me childhood memories with her brother. 
shimmering through the irrigation ditch in the mud with a make sh- with makeshift weapons and rifles. Also with Dad, Dree said. She also remembered with a laugh, we fought and rode horses on Sundays with Dad, chores, kid stuff. It's obvious to see Chad Sable spent a lot of his childhood and teen years with his family. His first job was a mechanic. He was a mechanic, a decent mechanic, his brother Trent said. He might have also been in the guard before joining the military, but he didn't leave without leaving his mark. Definitely made me a tougher human being. He was bigger than me and taught me to be strong and not let anyone convince you otherwise, no matter what your size is, his sister Dere said warmly. Naturally, they also worried about him, hoping he would be okay, taking care of his wife and children. We were always worried for him and his well-being, hoping he came back the same. We rallied around his wife, daughters, and son, making sure they attended holidays and family things. Chad joined the military because of the 9-11 terrorist attacks at the age of 26. Joining the military, military meant he had to move from Utah to North Carolina. I went through a selection for a special unit, and this is where the unit is, he said. He hasn't told me many experiences, but he told me a lot about the training school, Dewey he said. Being in the military had its struggles, but it was also enjoyable, enjoyable for Chad. I have to get up at 5 a.m., 5 a.m., go to the gym, then go to the office and figure out what I have to do. Depending th- on the day, I either have to attend a shooting course, jump out of an airplane, use explosives, take part in night training, which involves radios, night observation devices, and learning how to disarm bombs, and then come home, he described. It wasn't all work, though. He also met some interesting people in the military, military and listened to their stories. A man grew up in Alaska without electricity or running water. He had never been in a car or airplane until the military. He had to learn about technology and things with electricity. He he drove by snowmobile or bush plane. Mike Smith might have been his name, he recalled. Now he is still in the military, but not in the same position. He is in charge of a group of men who annoy him sometimes. You might be wondering, did he accomplish anything? He did. He was awarded the Bronze Star. Wikipedia defines a Bronze Star as a a United States Armed Forces decoration awarded to members of the United States Armed Forces for either heroic achievement Heroic service, meritorious achievement, or meritorious service in a combat zone. This isn't the greatest accomplishment he has earned. He says his greatest accomplishment is being a father. His brother describes him, describes him as a jokester with a serious side and make sure to keep him fed because he can turn him into a princess if he doesn't get his groceries, food. He's expected to retire in about five years. At least his si- sister thinks so. I would expect him to retire. He always says he's going to get out, but never does. Maybe in five-ish years. He just loves it so much. He also gave me a piece of advice that I think applies to everyone. Find that one thing you love and do whatever it takes to do that as a job so that so that when you have to go to work it, and it makes you happy, even if it's trade school or finishing college with a degree. Our whole family admires him and loves him, and I hope he knows it. He is a very special person and contributes to the world in an amazing way. Hello. Oh, Hello, my name is Audrey Davenport, and I decided to write a feature article about my grandma. Uh, Grandma Debbie, and she's a beekeeper. So a beekeeper's job gets a beekeeper become beekeepers become a busy bee. A beekeeper's job gets harder as the season progresses. By Audrey Davenport, March 29, 2022. It's very difficult, beekeeper Deb says. Up in Northern California, Debbie Davenport searches the bee colony for yet another queen bee. As some of her workers help her search, a hiss echoes throughout the colony. A large scaled body peeks its triangular head out of its hiding spot. In seconds, the rattlesnake was dead. But even with that, the looks would give anyone a chill. Being funny, one of the workers threw it at Debbie, which of course caused a small scream. You're probably wondering, is this what a normal beekeeper's day would look like? Are rattlesnakes always around? On a daily basis, no, a beekeeper's day wouldn't have a rattlesnake enter their working areas. But there are other conflicts with the bees themselves. When thoughts of a beekeeper enter your mind, what do you think about? Most likely bees and hives. Katie Davenport, Deb's daughter-in-law, after describing who she thinks Deb is, mentions, I would say selfless and hardworking. After knowing her for nearly 23 years, Katie Davenport doesn't hesitate to respond. Growing up, a, growing up on a bee farm in Northern California, Deb's first instinct was to become a beekeeper like her father when she was young. Ryan Davenport, Deb's son, who's known her for 30 years now, after Deb and his father got married when he was in sixth grade, says she grew up on a bee farm. Her dad was a beekeeper. Her brother was a beekeeper. That's probably why she wanted to w- become a beekeeper, too. Having the hard task of finding queen bees to start the colony and sell to others, Deb's busy season is just starting. Though you may think that a beekeeper season would have already started, Deb explains, it's not crazy busy yet, but it's coming, and then things are a little different for me. As trucks pull in daily with new bees, Debbie is off like a busy bee. 
With her 12-year experience, though, she's ready for it. With the pollination season almost being done, the bees get a quick break before heading off for another couple months to work. With Deb's sleeves rolled up and ready, she starts processing the three-pound colonies to find the queen bee, while others work on unloading the large bees' trucks. For the next few hours, she has the job of going through the 50,000 bees to find the one queen among them. While she works on her task, other lo- unloads, others unload the bees from the trucks and work on pollen patties. With the 86-degree weather down in California, lots of the hills were turned brown soon, so it's the beekeeper's job to make the bees food, called pollen pa- patties. The weather definitely isn't the only daily conflict of being a beekeeper, but it's one of the main ones. As the economy goes up, sale prices follow in their lead. This caused everything to go up, including the things beekeepers need to use, like fuel. As mentioned earlier, fuel itself is a challenge as prices go up in California and all over the USA. Beekeepers have to keep in mind that they need to save money for diesel and fuel. With droughts coming in quickly, the hot, sunny weather conflicts with bees, making each worker have to get up bright and early so the bees don't get a heat stroke. One of the biggest challenges are the bees, though. With the weather getting warmer, warmer, insects invite themselves to stay on bees. Mites, little insects cling on, that cling on to the bigger insects, love the bees the most. Mo- but mites carry diseases that infect the bees. As Deb rocked in a chair outside of her house, she described what it would look like, what it would be like with a look of pretty. It's like having a basketball stuck on your back, she says. Even if you're busy. Jeez. Even if you're busy, try to make the best of things. After all, they won't always be. There, Deb says. I try to make the best of whatever whatever situation I'm in, so I'm enjoying it. Deb rocks back and forth in her rocking chair. Deb rocks back and forth in her rocking chair as the California winds whisked in her hair before going into the kitchen to homemade burritos and tacos. Even though a rattlesnake didn't enter the bees' campus like the day earlier, she was ready for another day full of surprises. After all, if you're a beekeeper, a normal day is still full of unexpected surprises. Um, hello, my name is Emma Hammond, and I decided to write a feature article on my brother, Ryan. Adventure in an unlikely place. Ryan Hammond, a hometown weirdo, decided to join the Marines straight out of high school. Could this be the big adventure he had been waiting for his whole life? From his time in the Marines, he learned that bad haircuts and weekly room checks were not for him. At least I learned consistency, structure, and punctuality, Ryan states. In the interview I had with his dad, I asked him what someone would think of Ryan if they had never met him. Tyson, Ryan's dad, replied while chuckling. Someone would probably think he is a little weird and different than others because of the things he says and does. This very energetic person works at the penitentiary. I asked Ryan's girlfriend, Cammie, how she feels about him working there and if she wished he worked somewhere else. She says, I don't mind where he works, wherever makes him happy. He's always talked about owning an arcade slash game store, though. His stepmom remembers taking him and his brother to Tilt, an arcade, all the time when they were younger. No figures he would want to own an arcade after it was part of his childhood. When I interviewed Ryan, I asked him what day he would want to relive. Surprisingly, he didn't say the day his child was born. Instead, he mentioned Tokyo Comic Con. He's always been a fan of books, Tyson says, so that doesn't surprise me. Growing up with Ryan, I always remember him either reading or playing video games. Even though these are polar opposites, they have always piqued Ryan's interest, and they still do to this day. Going back to the beginning question I asked, Japan was one of the biggest adventures this hometown weirdo had ever had, but his adventure with his girlfriend and new baby boy is just beginning. Maybe this will become his biggest adventure yet. Who knows? Hello, my name is August Hickox, and I'm and I wrote my feature article about my grandpa. From Queens to Walla Walla, a profile of Gregory Grasso. 68-year-old man Gregory Grasso was born in New York on October 26, 1954, and standing at 5 foot 10, he is the tallest member of his family. Greg has always had a knack for gardening. Even now, in 2022, he has recently planted seeds for his backyard gardening hobby. This didn't start recently. Greg's father gardened while he was growing up in New York, and he always really liked the entire effect of gardening. Greg was born in Queens and lived there for over two decades, but decided that maybe living somewhere else would be better for the future of his family. He said, I lived in New York for 23 years, and there's always something to do and some time to do it in New York. Interestingly, even though he is 68 now and was 23 when he left New York, you can still hear a little bit of the accent that he has. After he decided he wanted to live somewhere else so that he could raise his family in a less populated area, Gregory moved to Winston-Salem, New York, North Carolina, where his daughter, Chessa, was born. 
After raising his daughter in North Carolina, the Grasso family moved around quite a bit, with Greg stating, I lived in North Carolina and moved to live in New Hampshire. Then I lived in Oregon, I lived in Nevada, and now I live in Washington. He was 23 when he moved for the first time. When he, when he moved to North Carolina and lived there for five years, he lived in New Hampshire for a couple of years, and et cetera. There are many states which are prone to natural disasters, like Kansas, which is the state that has the most tornadoes because it's such a flat state. Gregory, Gregory was, populated in, was in a populated state that used a lot of energy and power. So one day in the 1960s, the power went out, causing the New York blackout. I was in the New York City blackout when the whole East Coast lost all of its power. Everyone waited a, and was confused and didn't know what was going on or what happened to cause the blackout. Like I said, Greg has always been interested in gardening, so it wasn't surprising to hear about his occupation. What is your most recent job and why did you choose it? He went on a monologue about what it led up to his job, but to the answer to the question, what was your most recent job? He responded, I help struggling businesses, mostly agricultural businesses like gardening and farming. This is quite interesting because after helping gardening businesses and companies for his job for so long, he decided to be a gardener and now gardens in his backyard. After retiring, Greg started watching sports on television such as the NFL, NBA, etc. Of all the sports he of all the sports to watch, he said that he couldn't pick a favorite, but he loves watching them with his grandkids. Now, in 2022, Greg is retired and lives in Walla Walla, Washington, where he takes care of his 14-year-old cat, Lucy, and takes care of his daughter and grandkids. My name is Logan Price, and I chose to write my feature article about my grandpa, Hugh. Hugh Jones was born on June 6, 1944, two days after D-Day in Watertown, New York. D-Day was the day when American forces stormed the beaches of Normandy, France. Um, facing the 156 Allied forces were nearly 50,000 German troops waiting for their arrival. The Allied forces won. Little to Hugh's knowledge, his father was fighting for the Allied forces in Normandy on D-Day. Growing up, Hugh played lots of football and played as linebacker and tackle. After graduating high school, he attended law school, which at the time, the, the, high, the law school that he went to was an all-boys school. And he played rugby for the team. He says, I remember watch, or his, his oldest daughter says, I remember watching him play at his rugby games, hoping that he wouldn't get hurt. One of his lasting memories from his rugby years was not only the bonds he had with his teammates, but also a hand injury that resulted in an injured finger. After graduating law school, I s served years in the five years in the Ar U.S. Army as an attorney from 1969 to 1974, and I've been practicing law for 53 years, he says. Hugh's family describes him as a family-loving man who loves to meet new people, is curious, kind, thoughtful, and very respected in the office and at home. Hugh says that, hold on. <laughs> He says that his most interesting case was in 1985 when he was hired to de defend Elizabeth Hasem, who, along with her boyfriend, was convicted of committing the 1985 murder of her parents. He got to travel to London to investigate the case. Hasem was sentenced to 90 years in prison, but she got released early and now lives in Canada. Her boyfriend was sentenced to life in prison, but he also got released early and now lives in Germany. Hugh now resides in Lynchburg, Virginia, with his wife, Betsy. My future plans are to gather with the family at Virginia Beach, slow down my law practice so I can retire and watch my family grow up, he says. Hello, my name is Carson Hayes and I chose to write about Julio Tapia. Uh, Julio Tapia, The Good Life by Carson Hayes. Is there really anything that will make you truly happy? That is the question that this man had to answer. Julio Tapia was, was the one who had to answer this question. He had to, to search through all his life memories and find what truly makes a person happy. Julio is a father of two boys. He says that his, that th that his greatest accomplishment is raising my two boys. He talked about how it challenged him to raise them right, but he also talked about how it, he enjoys raising his kids and all the memories that come with it. Uh, Julio says it challenges you to show them the right way and how to treat people with respect and how to work hard for what you want in life. He started he stated that this was how he how he was challenged to raise his kids kids. One of Julio's friends, Doug Hayes, told me that Julio's 
best accomplishment was raising a good kid actually two good kids and Julio's son Christian Tapia said jokingly that Julio's worst shock accomplishment was having my brother another one of Julio's greatest accomplishment is his job he works with kids at the juvenile detention center he said I work with at-risk kids here in town Julio says he really he really op- that this has really opened his eyes and allowed him him to see ha- troubled kids and how and what they go through in life. He told me that he loved being there for those kids and helping them. Julio says working at the juvenile detention center is one of his greatest accom- life accomplishments. For him, it is close behind raising his two kids. Although Julio did not mention soccer when he sat down with me, most people know him as a soccer know-it-all or soccer star. He has his own soccer training camp called Tapia Academy and helps out with most soccer things around town. Christian Tapia and Doug Hayes both said, the first thing that comes to mind when they think of Julio is soccer. Christian Tapia also said that Julio's greatest accomplishment was when he went to Spain, that he went to Spain when he was in high school. Christian also noted that his favorite thing about Julio was that he trains me for soccer. Uh, Julio says, one thing I enjoy in life is working with kids and just being a role, being able to be a role model for, for kids. That's why he talk, what he talked about is about working with kids and helping them be, and being a role model for kids. So is there anything that will make you truly happy for Julio? It, for Julio Tapia, it's, it's a yes. He finds his answer to this question through people and relationship, relationships. He finds the answer mostly through his family, his job, and soccer. Um, okay. My name is Kittrick Stroh, and my, pres- my feature article is about Jeffrey Mark Pryor. What do you think of having four young children? Jeff Pryor thinks of it as a blessing. On a clear spring day in 2022, I had the chance to sit down and interview Jeff Pryor. He told me about when he donated his kidney. Dr. Jeff Pryor, caring father of four and helps helps and cares for his patients. When he was faced with the opportunity to do something great, he took the chance. Jeff Pryor explained to me that as a doctor, you do things with patients every day that that are supposed to keep them healthier, but you don't necessarily don't necessarily do anything specifically that you can say well, this will change their life he exclaimed jeff said that when he agreed to give his kidney she was in disbelief doubting him sarah was shocked someone who didn't even know her very well her family wasn't a match and now someone took the test and finally matched and agreed to give their kidney even some other people were in disbelief but most were happy and proud that he took the opportunity to help someone for the rest of their lives Jeff's wife, Alexis Pryor, was proud of him and thankful he, he helped her friend live. Sarah Cronstead is the woman, the woman who received the kidney transplant. She explained that without a kidney, you can't do much, even close to anything. Without a properly functioning kidney, you can't do much like sports. Jeff Pryor taught me a very important lesson in life. Sometimes you have to do the right thing, especially when it comes to saving someone's life. Hello, my name is Cyrus Stumser, and I did my interview on my grandfather, Steve Kidwell. From Austria to Illinois, Steve Kidwell's exciting journey. Steve Kidwell was born in a United States military base in Austria. Around him, there were a lot of snow-covered mountain peaks. Steve Kidwell is my grandfather. It is a very cold place in Austria, where the Central Eastern Alps are located. The Central Eastern Alps, also known as the Austrian Alps, or just the Central Alps, form the eastern part of the Alpine Divide. The highest point in the Central Eastern Alps is 12,461 feet, or 3,798 meters. His parents were in duty for the U.S. military when his mother gave birth to him in Austria. When his parents were done with their shift in Austria, they moved back to America with Steve, who was at a very young age. While Steve Kidwell was a child in America, one of his hobbies was playing sports. Like any other kid at that time, I liked playing baseball, he said. He also played some pickup football when he had the time. 
When he had the chance to go to college, he chose to go to Marquette University, which is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was tough getting used to college for him. It was tough getting used to being in a dorm room, he said, especially the dorm food. When he was done with college, Steve Kidwell got a job as an electric utility worker. He worked at power plants, coal, coal boilers, and nuclear reactors. When I asked him what his favorite part of his job was, he replied, my favorite part of my job, uh, that was solving problems. Steve Kidwell had two kids with his wife, Irene Kidwell. He liked playing with his children when they were young. He's a great sense of humor, says his wife, Irene. Steve enjoyed taking his children on vacation. One of his favorite memories is when he took to his children to a soccer tournament and watched them play. From this interview, I learned that you don't have to do flashy things to succeed in life. You can have a normal life and be happy. My name is Easton Van Dyke, um, and uh, I interviewed uh, John Crimmings. Um, it was a beautiful day on the water. The fish were jumping as he cast his line. John was going to have a good day fishing on the river. When I had the chance to call John Crimmings, I found s out some amazing stories about his life. When he was a kid, he was an average neighborhood boy. I played ball like the other boys did and did everything a normal kid did. According to John, he was a very normal kid and never thought that he would make a difference in the world. But he went to the University of Wisconsin and then got drafted into the war. John says, it was, a, it was scary thinking about going to the war, and I thought I might not make it back. During his time in the military, he fought hard and was shot twice and blown up by a landmine. He got hurt so bad they had to send him home. His daughter-in-law, Danielle Van Dyke, thinks he has a, a lot of knowledge and that he taught her many different life skills. His, his wife, Debbie Booth, says that the first time she met him, he had one of her friends introduce them. Debbie thought that he was a gentleman. Not too long after that night in Telkeetna, they were fishing together on the Telkeetna River and then getting married. When I was a kid, we went to Wisconsin to visit them. And my grandpa taught me how to fish in their creek. We ended up catching quite a few fish. He also taught me how to gamble, and that is a very valid life lesson. We spent hours playing poker, and we spend more hours every time he comes and visits us. In addition, I was taught to shoot by my grandpa. We always talk about hunting season and guns, and the best, for example, the best place to shoot an elk. Um, we're he's very excited because he gets to go on a big elk hunt next year, and he hopes that he can shoot an elk. Hello, I'm Athena Strickler, and I'm writing about my grandmother, Sally Strickler. Compassion, the life of Sally Strickler, written by Athena Strickler. From a small ranch in Joseph, Oregon, to all the way over in northern Italy, the spiraling mountain peaks and the glaciers, the excitement of everything, these are all things that Sally Strickler remembers about her life. Even though she was Somewhat isolated from meeting many people where she grew up, she enjoyed it all the same. She told me, I loved it there. I had one neighborhood friend who was probably two miles away. Other than that, I mostly played with my brother Tom, or I played by myself, and I learned to entertain myself, which I think is something that has served me well through life, because any time I'm, alo I'm alone, I'm not bored, and I'm not unhappy, I just learned to make my own happiness. When she grew up, she married, had children, then traveled the world after retirement. Her life has most certainly been interesting. Jeff Reese Strickler, Sally Strickler's son, described his mother as somebody who lives life in a really simple way. She's always been a subscriber to this idea that everything is in moderation, including moderation. And then continued. She's somebody that has always had a great deal of compassion for others. She's a person that always listens to other people and remembers other people. 
when Sally Strickler's father died, it no doubt took a harsh hit on the entire family, especially her mother. Obviously, hard on Sally's mother because she was his caregiver. People approach these things differently. You know, some people are willing to provide their spouse that level of care and diligence and a sense to sacrifice their own well-being, happiness, however you want to say it. And that's really meaningful when someone's willing to do that. So Grammy gave up, as I say, a decade plus time that should have been their golden years together, he described. When her mother was placed in a nursing home, Sally Strickler called her frequently. At about age 100, Miss Strickler's mother passed away. Strickler decided to become a school teacher after her parents persuaded her to go to college. She taught for about 40 years and eventually had two children, a boy and a girl. After an unhappy marriage, Strickler divorced her husband. After retirement, Miss Strickler decided to travel, joined by her partner, Dan, who she has known for 54 years. When asked about how they met, Dan recounted, well, I was at Washington State working on my master's degree in math, and she was there at summer school taking chemistry, and she was also working at the main desk there at the dormitory, so I just went by and we started talking, and that's how I met her. When she travels, Strickler for prefers to cook at home and would rather not visit most museums, besides when it comes to learning about the Eastern European countries, where she enjoys her hearing about the culture and history of the people there. When she was asked about boring museums she had gone to, she replied, yes. When she's not traveling, Strickler enjoys sewing and working in her garden. One memorable experience she had, she had when she was traveling was when Strickler visited northern Italy. As she remembers it, that trip was probably one of my most exciting moments because I had always wanted to do it from the very first time I had gone to Europe. She continues to describe the beautiful view and then adds, now, if you want to know a memorable moment that wasn't so beautiful, it was probably figuring out our way through the Russian subway system. Sally Strickler's life has been filled with plenty of challenges, but in the end, her kindness and understanding has always been what people remember her for. To quote Strickler herself, happiness is what you make it and where you make it. Uh, hi, um, I'm writing about uh, James Cooley, my grandpa, and I'm Madison Doyle, so uh, A Trip Around the World by Madison Doyle. Uh, James Brian Cooley, or Jim, or Jimbo as his friends and family call him, has accomplished many things in life. He has a big smile, a white beard, and has lived for 67 years, and is almost always in a good mood. His favorite show to watch is Time Team, which is about English archaeology and digging up old English buildings. Um, he's lived in Wooster, Ohio, St. Louis, Missouri, Atlanta, Georgia, Friedberg, Germany, Stanford, Washington, Seattle, Washington, Kamado Island, Washington, and Walla Walla, Washington. <laughs> uh, at age 67, Mr. Cooley recalls memories of the Army. Um, it was 1975. I was 20. I went to basic training in Fort Jackson, Car South Carolina. Then I went to Fort Gordon, Georgia for electronics training. And finally, I went to Friedberg, Germany, where I was a field service repairman, repairing radios and communication on tanks and artillery. Uh, when I asked Mr. Cooley why his name his namesake, uh, such a similar name, James Ryan Cooley, he responded with a rather surprising response. He was hesitant to say, I don't know. It was just a thing of the day. I guess I, I kind of wanted to keep the family legacy alive. Also, all the people named James are destined to be geniuses. <coughs> um, Mr. Cooley has also had a very successful career in the, in the culinary field. His daughter, Michelle Cooley, reveals, When I was younger, he made this beef and won the Mr. Beef competition with it. Um, his favorite things to cook are a Cajun food, Asian food, and cooking for his family in general. I personally love his cooking. Uh, during his career, Mr. Cooley worked at a company called Allegiant, a tech company. He was the manag general manager and executive chef. Um, he worked there for a while, but, that, but, Allegiant, but Allegiant went broke, and he was transferred to Rochester, New York, where he worked at a restaurant um, where he got to serve the Buffalo Bills uh, team a number of times, like during summers. Uh, 
Then he worked at Seattle University as the executive chef um, and served over 800,000 meals in 11 years working there. Uh, he then worked at Starbu at the Starbucks headquarters, uh, writing menus and paying workers. Um, Mr. Cooley is a man of many names and overall many talents. Some call him Jim, some call him Chef, but some call him Jimmel. As for me, I'm proud to call him Poppy. Thank you so much to our participants in our Advanced Writing Projects feature article gala for day one. Let's give each other a round of applause. Thank you to all our students who participated today. Thank you for all of us who joined at home. Tomorrow, we will also have another day of wonderful feature articles being read, so make sure to tune in. Go ahead and check the Garrison webpage. Under the Garrison News tab, you will find a link to our class, sixth grade writing projects, and there will be one link for you to click on for tomorrow as well. Alrighty, folks, thank you so much for joining.